Fortunate to have Lyndon Harris here tonight. She is the uh, author, editor of Right Here, Right Now. She's the founder and the director of Hidden Voices. That's an arts collective. And what they do is they work with underrepresented communities uh, and, and they tell their stories through performances, uh, through exhibits, different kinds of, of media. Her book right here, right now, is part of the project Serving Life, Revisiting Justice. Uh, since uh, 2003, she's worked with underrepresented under uh, represented communities to, to create different kinds of, of works to tell, her, uh, tell their story, get their story out. Uh, she, is, uh, she was named the North Carolina Playwriting Fellow in 2019-2020. She teaches stories for social change at Duke University, and they're the, the publisher of her book. And I think there's probably no better person that we could have to talk to, to Lyndon than Lisa Armstrong. She's an award-winning journalist. Her stories have appeared in the New York Times, The Intercept, Daily Beast, USA Today, uh, Rolling Stones, The New Yorker. But the, the way we got uh, to know Lisa is she was a 2015, 2016 Rosalind Carter Mental Health Journalism Fellow. Um, and if you're not familiar with the fellowship, uh, journalists uh, and others, make a proposal that they want to look, they want to investigate a particular area of mental health, and they propose a way to get their, uh, their uh, information, their stories published. And Lisa's was to investigate people who have been sentenced to life without parole for crimes committed when they were under 18 years old, and how mental health plays a part in the lives of these, uh, these students. Uh, we're gonna, somebody has hit the wrong Thing. So we'll uh, close that and get back to us. Um, so, and, and that was uh, published um, in The Intercept. It was called Hard Time, as I recall. She is currently a Knight Wallace um, reporting fellow. She is an associate professor at uh, uh, the Craig Newmart uh, Graduate School of Journalism, and we are delighted to have you both here. And I wanted to start years ago, um, the communications director for the prison system in Oklahoma told me, he said, you know, we send people to prison as punishment, not for punishment. And it, it is something that has stuck with me for years because, Lisa, I think as, as you and Lyndon both know, uh, what the people on death row have to face uh, is not the being there as punishment. They are very often there um, and receiving punishment. So, Lisa, let me turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Tony. Um, I'm really happy to be having this conversation with Lyndon, um, having read this incredible book, um, incredible collection of stories of people on death row. And so Lyndon, I, I wanna start by asking you how this book came to be. As Tony uh, mentioned, it was part of Hidden Voices. Um, but tell me about the process of one, uh, gathering the stories and then why you decided to put them in book format. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Thank you, Tony. I mean, it's really quite a thrill to be here with um, with you all. Uh, so the, we started the project Serving Life, Revisioning Justice um, because one of the men living on death row read an article about our work. And at the time, we were working on a project called None of the Above, Dismantling the School to Prison Pipeline. So the head of the programs, the director of programs at um, the Maximum Security Prison in Raleigh asked us if we would come do a program with the men living on death row. And I, you know, we said, 
well, let's revisit it in six months, but come to one of these performances. So he did, and it was after that that we came into the prison, came onto death row, and were able to work in person um, with the guys there. So we we started out just we just took we have a process we use with Hidden Voices to develop a project in any community. So we brought that same kind of process in with just six men. So it was like a circle of stakeholders and we started through the process. And the first question we always ask is about outcomes. And we ask the stakeholders like, um, what do you wanna see nationally from participating in this project? What do you wanna see in your community? And what do you wanna see in yourself? How do you wanna develop personally by virtue of being part of this? And um, the guys, the number one um, outcome they wanted to see is they said, we want people to know we're not monsters. So that's how it started. So one of the things that struck me, and for those who haven't seen the book, it's broken up so that people are telling stories of what happened to them at different stages of their lives. And I think what a lot of people don't think about when they think about incarceration, they think about the people at the point in time that they've committed a particular crime. And that's the focus, um, even in terms of the carceral system, the focus is on you did this and we're punishing you for this thing that you did. But people don't really look at the genesis. Like they don't look at, well, what happened to you to put you in a situation where you committed this crime? And so one of the things that struck me about this book is that you go all the way back and have men telling stories of earliest childhood. Um, and it shows some of the trauma that people experience. So I wanted to first ask you why you chose to structure the book that way and to have people telling stories of their entire life and then their lives and then and then ask you to to read one of the the pieces from from some of the men talking about early childhood sure that's a great idea um well you know we went round and around about how to tell these stories but there was something about telling the stories from they started just infancy and then moved to um, the final stories about someone facing execution so you can almost read the entire book. I mean, they're tiny vignettes, but you could almost read it as one person's story. Um, you know, it's clearly not one person's story, but it has that, um, I wanted uh, listeners to go on a journey and to really be able to sort of put themselves into that pathway of what you know has been called the cradle to prison pipeline. And so that was, I thought, well, let's just move that way. Let's start you know, in infancy and um, see where it leads us. So, um, story. Yeah. Because I mean, I think it's just really important, again, for folks who haven't had a chance to read the book to, to hear one of the stories. Yeah, and this one, I. I, I'm choosing this one because I just, um, anyway, you'll see. It's called Downpour. Growing up in my house was a fucking horrific, crazy, sad experience. I remember this one cinder block house we lived in. Man, the windows busted out and covered with plastic. If we wanted warm water, we had to heat it on the stove. And my dad, he beat my mom all the time. Then they'd make up. I hated that shit. Now, this is very personal. We were living in that cinder block shack, and this one night when my baby brother was about a month old, dad beat my mom up. Then he told mom to get the hell out of the house and take us kids with her. Thing is, it was one in the morning, and we didn't have anywhere else to go. Plus, it was raining, not a hard downpour, but a steady drizzle. So we huddled up under this huge oak tree. Mom held the baby and I clung to her side while she covered us with her jacket the best she could. We stayed under that tree till dawn. When it was light, mom gave me the baby to hold while she went to check if dad had passed out from being drunk so we could go back inside. I tried to keep the baby warm, but by nighttime he was sick. He caught pneumonia and died in his crib one night, not even a week later. Thing is, nobody to this day has ever mentioned anything about what happened, but I didn't forget. I used to go to his grave site and put flowers by the little headstone. Soon as I was old enough, I got his initials tattooed on my left arm. So I always carry him with me in memory. 
I wonder sometimes what our lives would have been like if he had lived, whether my other brother and me would have lived different lives than becoming addicts. I don't know. When you're a kid, you don't got perspective. You just got bruises. Thank you. Um, and before I continue the questions, why, why did you pick that one to read? You know, it's hard for me to even read them, you know, because I see this man, I know him and, and love him. So um, because that story, like so many of these, it just brings up the themes of who lives on death row. You know, it's poor people. It's uh, people who've dealt with housing insecurity, poverty, PTSD, mental health issues, substance abuse, family violence. Um, you know, you just see like in this little tiny story, all of these themes that get repeated throughout these lives. And, um, and you also see at the core of it, a really tender young heart. And so I wanna ask you a bit about um, having people tell these stories and you know and in some cases there are people like i you know in, in that story people forgot who kind of moved on but i didn't forget and so you're asking folks and this is something that you know i face as a journalist i'm often asking people to relive their trauma to tell me about some of the most traumatic moments of their lives and as you just said it's like this is someone you know that you you've grown to care about so the first question i have is how do you go through that process? Like, how do you make sure that in having people retell these stories that they're okay remembering these things? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question because um, a lot of times the work we do is therapeutic, but we're not therapists, uh, we're artists. And so that's a really different, um, a, a really different kind of calling. Um, so, uh, well, this is, this is, is interesting. So one of the way we would run a session is we'd all be sitting around a table together and then we would do a check-in because I, I'm trained as a restorative justice circle keeper. So we would kind of bring that model a little bit. So we would do a check-in and then we'd play a game. So we'd play basically like a theater improv game. Um, and we play the silliest games I could come up with. We play bunny bunny and zip zap zap, you know, and just these ridiculous games. And it's really uh, kind of funny to think about, you know, you've got a dozen or 15 or however many men, you know, convicted of murder uh, in a room and they're just being incredibly silly. So that's the way we would start a session. And then we would have prompts and we would invite people for the next week to bring something they wanted to share based on that prompt. So there was time for them to reflect on, on what they might want to share. And there was this beautiful kind of um, empathy between the men. And also when we did a story slam with as many as 40 men, um, which I also did on death row, that when a man would start, occasionally would start to weep, you know, tears would be rolling down his face and nobody would reach over and like hug him or pat him or try to talk him out of what he was feeling. There was just this deep, deep respect and silence. And so you had this community of people welcoming that present moment of what was actually happening for this person. And I think actually that, which I've maybe never thought of it this way before, but I feel like that there was something incredibly healing about that with all of these people welcoming the moment and what you were bringing and nobody trying to make you feel better about it. Um, yeah. And the the second part of that question is about the impact that gathering these stories had on you because again there's the whole process of even you know for folks who haven't been into a prison the process of going in even if you've been invited it's like hearing that gate slam behind you there there's something about feeling trapped inside um even though you know that you're coming out but then again you're hearing these stories and you're hearing them over you're building a relationship with people over a period of time and in your case, these are folks who are on death row. So it's not like, um, chances are they're, they're not, they're not leaving prison. They're not coming out. 
And so I imagine that there's an emotional bond that is formed. And so I wanted to know what impact has this work had on you personally? Oh, yeah. Boy, when you said that about going into the prison, the sound of all of those doors after door after door, yeah, closing behind you, you do realize you aren't getting out unless somebody else lets you out. So it is a really, um, even, um, even knowing you are going to come out in a couple of hours, you really do have that sense of I'm absolutely in no way in control or in charge. Um, I think, um, you know, it, knowing these men through their, through personal interactions, through letters, through phone calls has just enriched my life immeasurably. I think that's how it has changed me. I was, I mean, all of the work that Hidden Voices does is with people who've experienced trauma, whether it's military service members or families fleeing, you know, domestic abuse or undocumented immigrants, that they all are people sharing these very challenging stories. So just for me as an individual, um, I'm real clear that that story is not my story and I don't have to make it about me. Um, and the less I make it about me and my, my feelings about what you've been gone through can actually not be helpful, <laughs> you know, that doesn't help. So the more I'm more of an, or we are more of an open space for somebody else to share, you know, the, the more useful we are. And that's really just important to me is that we're useful. So it's just incredibly enriched my life and given me the opportunity to share their stories, you know, to a, a, a much wider audience. They didn't, I mean, when we started working in the prison in North Carolina, they didn't have access to phones. So the only way they had of communicating was through letters outside. And they were allowed one phone call a year one 15 minute phone call a year at Christmas. So, um, you know, so I, I mean, I, I really understand what the gift we've been given and the importance of sharing it. And how did you get people to, I guess, sort of dig so deep and tell these really personal stories? Um, because, you know, again, from, from doing this work, a lot of times people haven't had that opportunity to talk to anyone about their their life and so it's you know and, and just for anyone I mean I think if if I started asking people questions which is what I do for a living if I started just pick someone randomly and started asking like tell me about these deeply personal moments of your life you know first of all people would think that was rude but they you know it's it's hard to go into that space so how did you get people to to like really feel and dig deep and, and tell these really rich stories yeah, um, I think really it's probably it comes out of the process we use in the very beginning, because we go into um, when we're developing a, developing a project with the community, we go in with questions, but absolutely no answers. So we don't have an agenda. We have questions so that by the time we finish working through the first two sessions together of answering those questions, we developed um, together kind of a roadmap. So everybody's, um, you know, we're looking at who's at the table and what can we create together and who needs to listen and who needs to talk. And so we are creating the whole thing together. So by the end, everybody has pretty much equal investment in seeing this come into being. So I think that's part of it. And the second part is that people just generally, the folks that we work with um, generally say, well, no one's ever asked me. You know, so that's the other part of it is having an opportunity to share something. And, you know, a lot of times they've never thought about things. For, they've not necessarily thought about the questions we're bringing. So we're discovering together, right? Um, it's not like they have an answer thought out already. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask um, about the, the reasons. So the stories are, there, there are no names, ages, like you, you don't, they're completely anonymous. And so I wanted to ask you about that choice because, you know, on the one hand, you would think that if you have a name, you have a place, you have, uh, 
you know, it, it gives you a sense of like, this is a real person in this particular prison and you can kind of envision it. Whereas if you don't have that name, you don't have that. So I wanted to ask about the choice to just have these completely anonymous with no, you know, no way to identify these folks in any way. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, there's kind of like different answers to it. One of them is just that with every Hidden Voices project, we always um, guarantee anonymity. So that we go in saying um, nobody will know who you are. You know, if you want to tell us something about your time in uh, military service, you know, it will not be tagged to you in any way. We always change names. We always change place names, you know, anything that could be identifiers. So that's just, that's like one piece of it. Um, in this particular situation, um, I, I think as Tony pointed out at the very beginning, um, there can be a real tendency inside prisons to think that those people living there are there to be punished. They're there for punishment. And, um, you know, I mean, I hate to say it, but the reality is that there is almost no oversight of what happens inside a prison. And so I really felt like it was doubly critical that these people be protected um, and that you know, I had told them that their names would not be attached. And that was part of the understanding of what they shared. Um, and then the final thing, which is really an artistic choice, is that these stories started out as readings, as um, kind of performances, you know, and or they could be sent into um, classrooms or faith communities and just read, you know, people could sit in a circle and read these stories that say I. And so whoever's reading it isn't trying to act like they're someone else, right? They're not like as if an actor were performing a piece about a character that they know something about this character. It's just me speaking these words in first person saying this happened. And it's a really powerful and profound process to have somebody and, and people would just start weeping sometimes reading someone else's story because it goes in so deeply because there's not this kind of barrier of oh this couldn't possibly be about me because the person who's told this story was a 27 year old you know latinx guy and i'm a middle-aged white female so it just kind of takes away that barrier so those are the reasons can you talk a little bit about the performance part of this and how, you know, because obviously a book will reach people in one way, a performance will reach folks in another way. And so what reaction have you seen from audiences who've heard this as a performance rather than reading it as a, as a book? Oh, yeah, it's really, um, it's pretty amazing to see. One of the things that we do is, um, on, when, when this is being done as a performance or a reading, on every uh, seat of folks who are coming, we put a piece of paper and a pen. And sometimes it's 500 people, sometimes it's 20. It doesn't matter. And then after the reading or after the um, performance of the stories, uh, before any kind of talkback or discussion, we invite audience members to write a response to the men to write a response that gives people time to take it in a little bit. And also because when we came, um, we're developing Serving Life, we wanted it to be a call and response. And we were trying to figure out how could we do that when there's just no access to these people living on death row. And we thought, oh, we could still do it by letters. So we would invite audience members and the letters have been I mean, sometimes people will write two or three pages, um, but almost always the essence of what they write is thank you. I, you know, I remember one, this one, somebody wrote, thank you for reminding ignorant and selfish people like me how valuable every life is. So I think over and over we hear people say, I have never thought about you. I am so sorry. Somebody wrote, I drive by a prison every day and never once have I thought about who's, I've never wondered who was inside. And then this person said, and now I'm just wondering what else I've never thought to wonder about. Um, so I 
do think in the performances, you know, and having that mo to, moment to communicate back how it affected you is really also gives people a chance to feel like, oh, yeah, I'm giving back. I'm letting these people know that someone's listening. They're not forgotten. They're not unheard. Do you do you send those letters to the men or? Yeah. And some some we've sent to their families. Um, I mean, one of the most. Um, one of the sort of uh, craziest moments was after this was a performance for like hundreds of people. And so there were three or four or five actors reading the stories. And um, we had invited family members to come and hear the, the readings and family members who lived close enough to drive. And so we had a big dinner beforehand for the family members who could come. And, you know, most of them had never met anyone else who had a a child or a family member sentenced to die. So first of all, that was really profound for them and, and really quite remarkable to meet another mother. And then um, at the end of it, you know, the audience, I remember this so vividly, the audience, I mean, they were on their feet. They were applauding. They were crying. They were, you know, they were, and the family members were just dumbstruck because they, they literally thought no one cared or no one would care. And then afterwards, this mom came up to me and I was, um, I thought she was going to say something like, you know, that was so moving or thank you for inviting me. Or, and she looked at me and she said, well, what I want to know is, when are you going to tell our story? And it was like, um, you know, the hair on my arm stood up. And I, I told her, I said, I don't know when, but I promise we will. And can, you, can you talk a little bit about, you know, why you felt that that was an important project to take on and, and what has happened with that? Yeah, it's, um, it's become a musical theater piece called A Good Boy that we're developing. And we just like last week had the first read and sing through of the whole piece. Um, I think that if the people living on death row are not often thought about, their families are never considered. And um, I mean, we do occasionally think about the profound impact that incarceration has on families and communities. And if you think about that and then you lay on top of it that you know that your parent, your cousin, your child, your grandchild is slated to be um, executed. I mean, that is just like yet another enormous trauma to put on top of communities that are already traumatized. And, you know, the, their faith leaders, their, their school teachers, uh, the, the ripple effect goes on and on and on. And I don't think we consider um, the layers of harm that we are doing. You've talked about people who've seen this and been moved. Um... But what, I don't know if you ever get people who don't show that same compassion, because after all, if you're on death row, yes, there are people who are on death row who are innocent. But if you committed whatever the crime is, it's, it's a violent crime likely where someone was probably killed. And so um, what do you say to people who bring that up to you and say, well, why should I care about this person? This person committed this crime. If, if you've had that experience and if you haven't, what would you say to someone if if they raised that point with you? Yeah, so so fantastic question, and yes, I've had that experience more than once, and um, and you know it's it's a really good question, right? And I think that um, part of the purpose of this book is really to walk people, like I said, on that journey of why we should care. Um, I think that, you know, there's an old saying, there's an old sort of um, wisdom tradition that if we are facing a persistent problem that we can't solve, we're probably asking the wrong question, right? And I think the question we all need to ask is who was harmed and how do we heal this harm? Because the criminal justice system does not usually serve anyone. The victims feel and the victims' families feel left out. 
They don't feel like they get closure. They don't feel like their needs are addressed. The family of the person who was convicted of the violent crime feel the same way. So I really think if we ask, you know, you look at some of these kids and you say, who was harmed? Well, heck, everybody was harmed. Everybody in that community was harmed and everybody associated with the victim was harmed. So how do we heal that? How do we revision a justice system that's moving toward actual justice, actual healing, actual restoring of community, rather than thinking that just <laughs> taking somebody and punishing them somehow is going to fix things? It doesn't. It makes it worse. And why, why death row? Like, why did you decide to pick? people on death row as opposed to just anyone who'd been incarcerated? Because I mean, a lot of these stories are very similar to stories that I've heard. Um, and so, yeah, why, why death row? Well, I mean, the simple answer is that's where we were invited. <laughs> you know, it, it was the director of programs for the prison invited us to come to death row because, and this is often the case on death row is that they are not allowed even what other prisoners are allowed, right? They're not allowed access to any kind of education. They're not allowed access to any kind of work for the most part. They're not, you know, so their opportunities are even more limited. Uh, but I mean, you know, and you're absolutely right that the issues that we see on death row are the issues we see um, throughout our carceral system. And, you know, to me, the most fundamental issue is poverty. I mean, there is nobody with money on death row. You know, there's nobody even middle class. I mean, there just is not. If you can afford an attorney, you don't end up on death row. And so the people who are there are people from poor communities who had attorneys who, um, you know, either weren't, weren't competent or were so overloaded as defense attorneys. They, I mean, lots and lots of these guys got one hour they were charged with a capital offense and they got an hour with an attorney. You know, they come from specific geographic locations. I mean, there are certain counties that send most of the people in this country to death row, right? So I think that, you know, there's certain skin colors. So I think there, there are very specific reasons that people end up on death row. I mean, there would be uh, the attorney general for, it might have been New Jersey or something, said, you know, getting getting selected for a as a capital case meaning being selected as defendant when you could get the death penalty. He said it's as random as a lightning strike. And I think that's absolutely true. I mean, in one sense. And on the other hand, you know, there's a small pool of people that that lightning's going to strike. Yeah. And what, I mean, what do you think is the solution? Like you've identified the cause, as the, the root cause as being, um, you know, people are impoverished, but what, what do you think would be the solution? Well, I really think, um, uh, well, I think, yeah, that's such a good question. I think, you know, I think the first solution is, um, my hope is that these stories humanize us, that they bring our own humanity forward so that we care about the people that we all have put into this situation I think it's really important that we all take responsibility for executing people, for allowing children to grow up in these circumstances. So I think the first step is caring and helping people to care. Um, and then I think, like I said, that, the, that it's really important that we use different questions here, that we really look at how do we heal the harm because there are countries who do this. It's not like we have to reinvent the wheel, right? There are countries doing an excellent job with, you know, a lot of the guys I know have been told directly from the warden of their prison, you are not here to be rehabilitated, right? And I think most people on the outside think, oh, that's exactly why people are in prison, right? No. <laughs> Not in this country, but there are countries where that absolutely is the case. There are countries where the corrections officers are mentors. They eat meals and they're in charge of very specific um, folks 
you know, living in prison. They work with them. They develop goals with them. They help them meet those goals. They eat meals together. They develop a relationship. And all of that's really forbidden in our system, right? Human relationships uh, are, are literally not allowed. So anyway, I think it's really clear the pathway we need to walk. I think other countries have done it and do it quite well. And we can look to them to um, learn a better a better um, way of healing and restoring communities. Yeah, I, I mean, so one of the things that I'm trying to formulate what the exact question would be, but one of the things about death row and... Um, you know, from, from the folks that I know who are on death row is that there's a certain level of terror that exists just being there because it's not, you know, if you're incarcerated, it's bad. As you said, it's not someplace where people are being rehabilitated and, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of trauma just being in that environment. But if you're on death row, you have, um, and you have stories of this, it's like one, you're waiting for any day to get a sheet of paper saying, here's your execution date. So you're basically waiting to know when you're going to be killed and then you're also around friends who are in the same boat, who one day they're, they're here and then the next day they're gone. And there's, there's a really moving story of, of um, someone who, who talked about coming in and being greeted by this, this older guy who sort of took him under his wing and, and um, you know, it, it talks about him being executed and basically... Uh, I think it, part of it was, you know, the, the fellow saying that every day that you're here, it's, it was almost an encouragement to live because it's like every day, you know, live because you don't know when it's going to be taken from you. And so um, I guess the question is, I mean, what, given everything that they've experienced, what were these men like? Like what, if you had to describe them, I know it was, you know, many of them, what, what are they like? And how do, they, um, how do they cope with this? Because I mean, that I can't imagine that. Like, it's it's you know. Yeah. No, I think most of us can't really imagine waiting for that envelope with your death date on it. Um, they all have PTSD. Um, I think pretty much everybody came into prison with that. Um, you know, mental health, uh, access to mental health services is just non-existent for most of folks in these communities. And so they, you know, have kind of brought that trauma, uh, massive amounts of trauma with them. And then being in a place where you're waiting to get that envelope is just uh, trauma laid on top of trauma. And and, you know, you, it's not a, um, I mean, it's fun. It's, it's funny. The men absolutely try to create a community. Most of them, you know, they, 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 there's a story in the book called the Huggy Boys. And it's about one of the officers who called them the Huggy Boys because they were always taking every opportunity they could to shake each other's hands or, you know, bump shoulders or something, something to, to create connection. But the reality is, is you have to be on guard all the time. Um, and there is a sort of a threat surrounding you, whether it's a, a, the threat of execution, the threat of some sort of repri reprisal by a corrections officer who feels like you did something you weren't supposed to or just had a bad day, um, but from another, you know, another person living uh, with you. So I think that it's just almost unthinkable what it would be like. So their anxiety level is super high, um, I think, all the time, which is one of the reasons we would play games, we'd play silly, dumb childhood games, you know, because it was so exuberant and joyful and just a moment free from that. Uh, at the same time, I have to say that with all the people I worked with in person and that I don't know how many, that might be 50 people or more, um, they were always incredibly respectful, always amazingly grateful um pretty willing well one of the things we did was we developed plays you know we developed a play and the guys after like six months of rehearsing they performed it for maybe 80 or 100 other men living on death row and some mental health people and corrections officers and administrators 
And at the end, and these guys were so nervous, you could see the sweat pouring down their faces. I mean, it was, some of them said that was the most scared they'd ever been in their lives. Um, but they also said it was the high point of their lives. They were sharing those stories. And um, the other men just were on their feet, clapping and applauding. And a lot of the guys were crying and saying, that was my story too. Um, so, so, you know, so you're getting this picture. These are, you know, some of them are small, some of them are big, some are very tough. Some have real, you know, kind of personas, but underneath it all, or like, um, for almost all of them who aren't profoundly mentally ill, that humanity and desire to be connected is so alive. And so I'm going to ask one last question and then, you know, leave time for, for other folks to ask questions. But I think, you know, that is one of the things that comes across in your, your book that I, I loved because I think often um, you don't see the humanity of folks who are incarcerated because we don't often get to see what goes on behind bars. And one of the things that struck me in doing, in, in doing this work is just the level of introspection and the honesty. I mean, people will tell me about the crimes that they've committed. And again, for any one of us to be asked about the worst thing that you've ever done, yeah. you probably don't really want to talk about it. And they do in this book, which is, you know, in a, in a really moving and compelling way. Um, so I just want to ask, my, my last question is, what do you want people to do? So if someone goes out, they, they buy this book, what, what do you want them to do afterwards? Um, well, I have a wish list. <laughs> so, um, you know, at the end of the book, there are resources. Uh, it's called Resources for Deeper Connection. So, um, so I, I'm really clear that I'm, I'm not an expert on the criminal justice system or the sociopolitical, you know, factors surrounding that. I'm just an expert on relationships and stories, you know. So if people, so they're, they're at the beginning of the book, there are a list of like sort of more um, books looking at the sociopolitical context. And at the end of the book, there, there are resources for how you might want to connect more deeply sort of in a heart level. Uh, my hope is that people read the book and then they buy two more copies and send them to their legislators or to a judge or to a social worker or to their faith leader that they say to other people in positions of influence, you also need to hear these stories because I really do feel like that's the first step is understanding what's actually going on. Um, and so that's my hope. And of course, I wanna see, um, I wanna see this lead to an end of the death penalty, to an end of life in prison without parole, and to an end of um, our really inhumane uh, carceral practices. I think that there is so much room for growth and change and that the time is now, I mean, like right now. So that that's my hope. So if um, you all have questions, there is a chat box. If you could write your questions in the, uh, the chat box and we'll get to those. Um, Lennon, I was just thinking as you all were talking, uh, Anthony Ray Hinton was one of the uh, people on our author program uh, a year or so ago. He spent 28 years on death row and each time he would get a death date. And it, I don't, I don't, the kindness you talked about, the people that you've met with on, on death row, uh, the serenity um, is something that, that I think I saw when we just, when Hinton and I visited when he was there. There is, there is something that I guess you have to do if you're on death row to maintain your mental health, isn't there? Um, yes, either people do a lot of prescription medications, um, which can be really helpful and necessary. And, um, you know, they, it's like it used to be called a penitentiary 
Right. It was for a, a place to be penitent and to become introspective, as you said. And so um, some of the men really use it as that opportunity that they would not otherwise have had to look at their lives and sort of get a very different perspective because they never had the space to do that before. Um, so, yeah, there is a kind of serenity that's possible for some people if they're willing to go there, you know, and to really, um, but that is a hard journey. Have you found that mental illness um, either increases on death row or maybe was one of the causes leading to death row? I think one of the things we have to really deal with in our country is that our county jails are our largest mental health facilities. And that is shameful. And so, yeah, people, I mean, some of the people are just, uh, the reality in which they live is not our consensus reality right? There's just almost no way to communicate with them. Um, but for the most part, it's more trauma responses. It's post-traumatic stress syndromes everywhere. And, um, you know, and you get a lot of, you see schizophrenia, you see, yeah, I mean, the you class sort of classic mental illnesses are just well represented in prison and um, certainly, certainly on death row. Well, you know, I was just thinking because with your performance and the different ways that you're telling the story, I was just, I was thinking of the, the book and the movie, uh, the green mile and what it must have been like you see with the actors, every time someone on death row is gone and the electricity, you know, suddenly goes down, the lights go down and then they come back on and they yeah. know somebody, the trauma, of that has to be incredible. Yeah. Yeah. These are people, you know, these are people who love each other. And um, the, the story that Lisa mentioned, you know, where the guy said, um, every day is worth living when you're, every day is worth celebrating when you're alive to see it. Um, and then having that person who's encouraged you, who's mentored you, who's brought you along and helped you make a kind of peace or a kind of life on death row to have them taken away. I mean, there was one guy they let have a, a going away party, actually, because he was so beloved by the guards, by the corrections officers, by the uh, everybody. And he, you know, he got his date. So they let him actually have a gathering to say goodbye to people. And, you know, doesn't that just make you take a step back and say, this is insane. What a crazy thing to do. Yeah. Have, uh, one of our, our audience was asking whether the people whose stories you tell, have they had a chance to either see the book or get a copy of the book or, or see their story in print? I don't know yet because the book was just published. We sent copies. Um, we've sent copies and I'm waiting to hear whether or not it's allowed in. It may be, it may not be, it may, you know, it may well be banned from prisons. We'll see. Maybe a copy will get in. I really hope so. But um, I do have a friend who uh, is like 35. He was in prison for, since he was 14, he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. So he was sentenced as a child to die in prison. And he was, uh, Equal Justice Institute argued his case and got him out. And so because he's out, I sent him a copy. So we'll see. Um, so he should, so there are, you know, there's at least one person who should see it. Yeah, because uh, it, it's really a case of validating them, showing others yeah. that they're human. I'm sorry, I, I have a, a follow-up question to that. Um, what do the corrections officers or wardens or prison prison staff who've seen the book like have have they seen the book and have they I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> so is your so you don't you don't want them to, to see it? That's kind of a terrible thing to say. Um, I you know, I want it to be able to go into the prisons because like somebody said to me, we need the hard stories because we try to bury them. 
um, one of the guys said, you know, we don't like to think about them either. And so sometimes that's really helpful for us to read these and to sort of say, yes, here it is represented for other people. So um, I kind of am more interested in it getting inside and to, you know, some of the people. But yeah, I would love to have, I mean, I've worked a, a fair amount with uh, correctional officers too, who've, uh, <laughs> you know, many of whom who, I mean, they live in, they, they work in horrible circumstances in our prisons. They, they suffer from, you know, they are tracking this world right along with the guys inside. And it's so, so unhealthy. I mean, corrections officers have the shortest lifespan of any um, police officers. So uh, yeah, I would love for them to see these stories. Absolutely. So Lyndon, then who is your audience? I mean, are you, are you, preaching to the choir here, the people that are interested in it are already the people who are concerned about what's going on in prison. I think there's a new audience. I mean, I bet Lisa has some thoughts on this too, but I think there is a new audience. I think there's, I mean, I know this is true. There's a whole new uh, curiosity uh, now, I think, from sort of just I don't know, can I say middle America, whatever that means? I mean, people, I think uh, over the past year or two years have sort of started looking around because of the Black Lives Matter movement and because of other things that have come forward going, wait, wait, what do I not know? You know, <laughs> there seems to be a whole world that I'm not um, not clear on, don't understand. So I think that actually the audience is, is, is broadening. And that's also the reason I'm hoping people will buy copies and send them to other folks, because I do feel like stories are a way into understanding. Lisa, you, you write about this as well. Here. Yeah, you I mean, I, I think that Lyndon is, is right, that um, I think because of you know, defund the police. I, I think people are actually looking at the systems that we think of as keeping us safe. So the police are supposed to keep us safe and then the police arrest the bad guys and then the bad guys get put in prison. And I think that's sort of people's thinking of, of the system. And I think they're realizing that that's not really how it works and that there is a curiosity. Uh, I mean, I will say that with my work though, there is still um, again, I, I, I write about people who have committed horrific crimes and it doesn't matter that they've experienced trauma as children. I, I will get some people who will say, I was moved by this story. I, I, I didn't know we locked children up for life or we put them in solitary confinement. And then I will get people who will say, you know, this person killed someone and this person is bad and they are always bad. And they're really, they don't leave room for redemption. So I think that's why, um, this book right here, right now, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's a collection of, of all of these stories and you see it from sort of beginning to end. And, and, and so I, I feel like it has uh, the potential to, to change some people's minds um, because just, you know, the way these folks have told their stories. Well, that and, and all of the, the cases that are now being looked at where we're finding more and more people who are wrongfully convicted uh, perhaps makes us have a reassessment of who are these people that that are behind bars and and what are we doing and uh, even movies like the Shawshank Redemption that um, give you an idea that someone comes out of prison and we haven't helped them along the way um, uh, to to be adjusted till they go back in again, that the system is is in fact broken. Um, so, Lyndon, how how do you hope that um, we can change this? How do we what what change do you think can come from this by understanding? I think that. Um, also, there are some wardens who are interested in change. There are some administrators who are interested in change. Where I think we're seeing a lot more people um, looking at the question of juvenile justice and sort of saying, you know, 
well, we need to intervene earlier in juvenile justice that system is not is maybe more open to a therapeutic approach i, I do feel like there are opportunities for and i've noticed that some of there have been wardens who've traveled to norway and other countries who have a much more um sane and redemptive system where the, the longest sentence you can get is 20 years so and if you think that most people on death row committed those crimes when they were teenagers or you know early 20s before as we know before the brain is fully developed um i think that you know science is is pushing us that way i think that people are becoming more open to questioning the systems that we have in place and whether it's just like lisa said that narrative we've been told about the police protecting us is not true for everyone um so i think that it's that this kind of change is starting to happen from different sort of um you know points of intervention um, and that's a that's a great thing to see because i think it's going to take that you know people on different levels and in different positions of power um questioning their own responsibility and their own roles and then looking to see how you can change it yeah it's it's like one of our audience uh, wrote about trying to break the stranglehold that punishment and retribution has uh, in the perception of what the, the prisons are supposed to be, which goes back to that original thing that I mentioned about uh, you you put people in prison as the punishment, not uh, not for the uh, the punishment. Um, and I'm I'm curious, we have a way of dealing with with issues in this country without going to the cause. Uh, whether that's prison, I, I think of that in terms of the immigration issues and, and things like that, the people coming into the country. Um, this might create a, a new conversation about dealing with causes uh, as well as, as uh, you know, what's happened perhaps. I sure hope so, because you're, I mean, you're absolutely right. And I, it goes back to that, you know, that wisdom about, I think we're asking the wrong questions. Um, and, and the questions are about, just like you said, how does this happen? What are the causes? Because we can deal with them. You know, we actually can. We can address childhood poverty. We can address mental health. We, you know, look at what the Carter Center has done. They're just, there are many, many, many ways to address the causes of violence and just locking up. You know, it's like one guy on death row said to me, we just can't kill all the wounded people. Mm -hmm. You know, and he's right. He's yeah. right. We have to go back to the beginning and, and look at all of the things that cause violence and say, how do we heal this? Mm -hmm. Lisa, you, you teach journalism. You are a journalist. How does it work to do, how, what impact does Lyndon's way of telling a story um, relate to the journalist's way? Because she, te she tells it through performance and other ways. How, how does that work? I mean, I, I think that one big difference is that journalists are supposed to provide context so, you know, the, the piece that I wrote while I was um, a fellow about these two young men who have been incarcerated since they were 16 and 17 um, for a crime that they, they committed then, um, I'm able to look at harsh sentencing of children and like the history and, and how that came about. Um, I'm able to look at what Lyndon talked about, brain development and the fact that your brain doesn't really fully develop until you're in your mid-20s, which means that the, the, the choices that you make, that all of us make as teenagers and as young adults, like we're, we're not making the best choices. So, you know, I think journalists are able to kind of provide that additional information so that people understand the cause of, you know, how did we get here? um which you know we don't offer solutions necessarily i mean i can interview someone who can offer a solution but i think it's really about um context but i i think you know i was telling lyndon that i i worked on a documentary a few years ago where there's a young man who's incarcerated at 16. um he he, he he's a composer he composed music and so the, the documentary aired it was, it was with live music it was performed um there was a, a spoken word poet who did the um, narration, 
And the response that people had to that, because I was able to see their response to that work, it was very interesting to see the difference between that and I don't get to see the responses to the things that I write other than when people write to me. So I think, you know, that there is real power in what Lyndon is doing. Obviously, I think as a journalist that there's power in what we, we do as well. It goes through the, the head and the heart, whether it's uh, uh, reading it uh, as a journalist or seeing it as a, as a performance. Uh, Lyndon's book is right here, right now, um, by the uh, Duke University Press. It's available on at your local independent bookstore like Acapella, our partner, or uh, Amazon, or any of those uh, places. So we would encourage you to uh, to get it. And as Lyndon said, get copies and send them around because that's the way uh, you change attitudes, right? Absolutely. So Lyndon Harris and uh, Lisa Armstrong, thank you all very much. This has been um, a really a fascinating program tonight. Again, it'll be on our uh, YouTube channel. Thank all of you for joining us and uh, we appreciate it. Thank you all very much and have a good evening. Thank you.